Hello and welcome back and today I want to talk about those questions that a number of NAS users have that they might be slightly too scared to ask or when people ask them everyone shouts them down and goes oh that's such a dumb question. Your test results came back positive. You're a stage 5 dumbass. Frankly there should be no dumb questions because a subject like NAS is incredibly niche. When you think about the entire IT industry and then within the entire IT industry you have sub C uh, c uh, categories like Mac and Windows and Linux and then within those you have subcategories of network and then within those you have storage you suddenly realize just how niche a subject like NAS truly is and because I run this channel for so many years it's so easy for me to go you know can't see the wood for the trees and ultimately not keep my feet on the ground so this video is about answering 10 questions that most people have shouted and gone, that's such a dumb question, how can you not know that? When really, these dumb questions are not that dumb at all when you step outside of NAS. So let's go through them. Let's start with question one. This question gets asked a lot more than a lot of NAS enthusiasts and server enthusiasts in general would care to think. Can you just take a drive out of one NAS and stick it in another from another brand? The simple answer is no, you cannot do that. Because when you put hard drives inside these systems, much like when you have a hard drive inside, say, a Windows laptop, it has the operating system within it it has the raid configuration sure but the file system the configuration of the data and the software included on it in one shape or form either spread across the drives or within within one of the primary drives within the mix thereby holding it all together means that you can't just take the drives out of this for example a sonority ds923 and stick them inside a qnap ts453e and then just hope your data will be seen it simply won't work because of the native structure of the data held within the os now that is not restricted to just these two nas brands hell it's not restricted to nas you can't take the drives for example out of a nas and put them inside a traditional das direct attached storage like a usb drive once again because of that structure within its own contained operating system you can take the drives out of a synology nas and put them in a Synology and in most cases can migrate the data over and the same goes for Acer Store, QNAP, Terramaster, all of the NAS brands but you can't take drives either partially or fully out of one NAS system and stick them in another NAS or another storage system without losing that data. You can't maintain it. The only um, example of an exception to this rule is within true NAS's structure and the way the data is contained in those blocks. But that's a very exceptional scenario. Again, slightly more to do with ZFS and true NAS, true NAS as a whole. another very common question and the simple answer is yes you 100% can use a network cable like the ones you connect with your router or switch put one end inside the NAS system in one of its network ports like so and then connect this end to your PC or Mac via its own Ethernet connector there. You can 100% do that. But just bear in mind that when doing that, it is not the same as connecting with a USB cable. What will happen is you'll connect this into your PC or Mac system, and like you would normally search the local area network with Synology Assistant, QFinder Pro, or whatever program you use to scan the local area network and find the NAS, what you'll find is your NAS will appear with a new IP. Traditionally, at least on Windows, starting with an IP 169. And when you are connecting with the NAS, you will now be connecting via at least a 100 megabytes per second connection there. So once you've connected into that there, you can then interact with the NAS just like you would over the local area network or remotely. But do bear in mind that sometimes when going in this way, you can eliminate a lot of remote access um, uh, options such as using the internet which means some of the apps and services that run on your NAS that that may be connected to the internet originally will no longer be able to establish that internet connection through your PC system so once again 
If you want to get a NAS and completely sever it from the internet, you can set the device up even on day one, connect an Ethernet cable, the network cable that's included with your PC or Mac, the other end in the NAS, turn the NAS on, and if you have already downloaded the software, uh, the DSM, QTS, whatever, for your NAS, you can install it. And from that moment, only ever connect with the NAS locally and directly point to point without a router or a switch. Sorry, just to add to that last point, it's worth also highlighting that you can use USB to network adapters as well. So if you're using uh, a laptop or a tablet system that doesn't have a network port on board because it's maybe a more compact or portable device you can use a usb to network adapter these can range from as little as eight nicker to about 20 odd if you want to go a bit beefier and get a larger network connection like a 2.5 or 5 gbe connection but again that network to network point logic is what's key Another very common question that has gone a little quieter over the last few years is these devices are covered in USB ports. Can you directly connect your laptop or uh, your Windows or Mac system to this via all of those lovely USB ports? Sadly, you can't. There is one example of a difference to that, that I'll talk about towards the end of this point, but you cannot connect with these devices USB to USB. You can use those adapters that I mentioned in the previous segment, but then that would classify as a network to network point. The reason you can't connect with these devices over USB is to do with something called the client host relationship. And in any connected device, and in USB, that's what's really important. One device has to be classified the host, and the other device has to be classified the client. And the host is the one that's in charge of what's going on. And in the case of a Mac or Windows system and a USB device, the Mac or Windows will always be the host, whereas the connected device would have to be the client. And in this case, for a USB, it would be an external USB storage device. It would be a network adapter. It would be a Wi-Fi dongle. It will be a number of devices where they are considered the client and your Windows or Mac system is the host. The problem with trying to connect to these over USB is the NAS is a host device. It acts as the PC, the primary, the controller. So if you try to connect your laptop, which is a host, with the NAS over USB, which was a protocol that is a host-client relationship protocol, the two wouldn't be able to communicate. So what you end up having is the Windows machine understanding something's there, and that's about it. And at the same time, the Windows machine uh, sorry, the NAS is seeing the Windows machine knowing something's connected but can't communicate with it. There are exceptions to that rule. Um, I would say certainly you can establish with the right software connecting to host devices and then one of them is designated a client or the secondary device, but that requires a third party device in the middle to manage that relationship. Now, why is it that you can connect to a NAS then over the network? That is to do with IP, um, uh, Internet Protocol. Um, with that IP level connectivity, it means both of the devices can communicate back and forth. And USB, by default, doesn't really have that without a manager in the middle. Now, I mentioned just before starting this segment, there is an exception to that rule. That exception to the rule was when uh, QNAP released um, their uh, 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 451B series. Now, that was a series of devices, 451A, I should say, the 51A series in 2 and 4 bay, that had a USB port that could act as direct connection, DAS, DAS. The problem was it was USB built on IP. So what that meant was is you weren't really using a real USB DAS connection. It was the equivalent of one of these kind of crammed inside, but connecting over USB. And the QNAP system allowing that USB connection, and the problem was it then severely limited the connection as network um, Ethernet LAN uh, by tradition or gigabit LAN is 100 to 109 megabytes whereas USB can reach bandwidth of 500 or so megabytes and even greater these days thanks to larger connected USB. So to summarize, you can definitely connect with a network cable as shown earlier on, but you cannot connect directly with USB.
Now we're getting into more traditional NAS use. And a lot of people that look at a NAS have slight qualms about these devices being on every single day of every single week, of every single month, of every single year. You know, do you have to leave these devices on all the time? And the answer is no, you don't. This is a device, a server that is designed to be accessible and designed to last days, weeks, months, and years without being turned off. However, you don't have to have it that way. And there are a number of different ways in which you can make sure the device is on for a fraction of that time. Um, systems such as WOL, Wake On LAN, which is the means to have this device connected on the local area network, and then via your phone, your laptop, your PC, your whatever, you can send a pulse that will wake the system up from an incredibly low level hibernation that is using next to no electricity whatsoever. On top of that, you can, with most traditional NAS, create a scheduled on and off. I did a video on this, uh, I believe on Boxing Day 2022, about eight ways to save power in your NAS. And one of the points I highlighted is you can have a scheduled on off. So if you know you're only going to use the NAS maybe nine to five, or you know you're only gonna use it in the evening, in the morning to watch your TV, you can have the system turn itself on and off at those times, and not on overnight and all day when you're not gonna be there. Same goes for hard drive spin down, you can get the drives in the hard drive settings of most NAS brands, definitely these two, to have the hard drives spin down automatically if they're not accessed for a period of time. Generally, they'll have a setting of between 10 and 20 minutes where if the hard drive array isn't accessed, the drives go into a low level spin, but you can lower that drastically down to a minute if you choose. Lastly, system hibernation. I just talked about it, the ability to have these NASes go into hibernation much quicker or much deeper as needed. So even though it is technically plugged into the mains 24 seven, the actual utility and power consumption and general access is so small, it is not really gonna make any kind of noticeable dent. Another interesting question that a lot of people seem to overlook and go, oh, that's a stupid question. When it isn't really, when you think about it, there's a lot of users that directly connect with these devices to edit photos and video. Maybe they're in a small office and in close proximity to this device. I've got two within a stone's throw of me right now powered on. Or simply that the device you've got is just making noise and you don't really want the fans on. What happens if you turn the fans off? Can you turn the fans off? And is it detrimental to do so. So first and foremost, yes, you can turn the fans down exceptionally low, but very few brands allow you to turn the fans off. A lot of brands, if you open up the back of the chassis, there's a little power connector, like on a PC, it's a little plug, and you can have the fans turned off if you choose. It's very easy. It won't really invalidate your warranty that you opened it up, but where it will invalidate your warranty is the fact that if you have that system on for days, weeks, months, years at a time, as it's getting access more, this system is heavily reliant on active airflow where there's lots of ventilation, I hate seagulls, um, going all the way through this system, uh, ventilation on the side, the front panel, and these fans, what they are doing is drawing air over the components inside, which have got little heat sinks on board, which are just standalone bits of metal, ventilated to allow the air to pass through, as these little metal panels draw heat from the components they're attached to and dissipate it into the air. Not having the fans there, having them on I should say, means that that heat is sort of being dissipated into the air, but it's not going anywhere. And the more you use the system for a longer amount of time, that heat becomes detrimental to the performance of the system. It means your CPU may throttle, it may mean that certain components like 10 GBE and more will not work as well. Moreover, this can be detrimental to the actual components and their durability. Something that will be picked up on the logs by the system as it notices the heat increasing, 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 uh, increasing. And after that, if it comes down to you having to try to submit the system for support under a warranty, that will get picked up. Do you're using the system in a way that it wasn't designed for? So yes, you can turn the fans down low. Yes, you can turn the fans off if you do a bit of fiddling but it can be detrimental to the system, and I certainly wouldn't recommend it. Another completely reasonable question, and arguably one that's become incredibly important, not only in terms of uh, the shifting climate change and 
the idea of the cost of electricity which is affecting a lot of people let's face it russia ukraine conflict is having a tremendous impact on the cost of electricity across greater europe but also the world is seeing an increase in electricity costs it is a very valid question to wonder about what does it cost to run one of these and if you go to a lot of forums particularly over the last few years when people would ask just how much does it cost to run these a day People get really snippy and they get really kind of, you get what you pay for and get really angry when it's an actually quite a reasonable question and one that I've tried to tackle for the last few months. Now, most NAS these days, when you get them, they are very power efficient. They are designed to be on for ages. There's a reason they use those small fans and not larger internal CPU fans. And even the PSUs themselves are designed to be quite limited in terms of their scope indeed these two NASs here arrive with between 100 uh, sorry uh, 90 and around 120 watt PSUs at this scale but that PSU that it arrives with you don't look at that number and go well that's how much it's going to use it's going to cost me a fortune it's not that is a maximum uh, what capacity that it can handle in reality these devices unless you are going hell for leather 100% CPU all the time 100% drive utilization and you're using massive drives um, the result is going to be that it is going to cost you fractions of pennies and cents a day and I do mean fractions in a lot of our um, equations when we were looking at these devices unless you were going flat out these devices were costing you like decimal point of a penny a day. Now, where are exceptions to that rule? When you go for large NATs with more aggressive CPUs, with more bays, when you're accessing the system with a CPU getting a lot hungrier over time there. But when it comes to most users, it's the fact that most four bays like this are incredibly cost efficient and won't cost you hardly anything throughout the course of the years are in use. Uh, comparative uh, to using a cloud and a laptop but also on top of that it's worth highlighting that NASes aren't going to be in most cases used 24 hours a day and most home users if it's on for 24 hours are only going to be accessing media or doing certain things or receiving camera alerts for a very brief period of time consequently the majority of the rest of the time the system's in hibernation that incredibly low level powerpoint that we just talked about earlier on or you're using wake on land or hibernation or power up and power down on a schedule and ultimately it means that these are not expensive to run 24 7 and do not just look at the power of the PSU that it's uh, that rated on the spec sheet and then do your math based on that. Another very valid question and one that I think a lot of people with even a moderate experience of building their own PC or experience in PC architecture do ask. Why are the CPUs on NAS so sh**? Now, that's true. Well, I did a whole dedicated video on why that is the case, which you can find, but it's still, that's a couple of years old, that video, and I think it's worth addressing. When people look at NATs like this, and they look at the price tag, three, four, five, six, seven hundred quid, and going higher, they look at the CPUs, like an embedded dual-core Ryzen there from AMD, an ARM 64-bit A55, We've got a real tech CPU here that would probably be inside a tablet or something these days. And we've got an Intel Celeron here on the table, a quad-core integrated graphic Celeron, but still a Celeron that's been around for donkey's years. So why is that the case that they use such, you know, arguably as far as the industry is concerned, low-end CPUs? But it comes down to that thing I mentioned earlier, 24-7 utilization. These devices are going to be on for a long period of time. At the same time, the energy that they're utilizing can't be detrimental to the system. They can't really use CPU fans or advanced cooling systems internally without completely throwing off the balance of power versus efficiency versus cooling. And at the same time, they have to use CPUs that are designed to do the most output as possible with the least power consumption during multiple access uh, periods. So the result is, yes you could use more powerful CPUs. And, you know, you would have a more powerful NAS, but at the same time, the power consumption would be higher, the heat generation would be higher, and there would have to be compensating factors against that that would not only uh, increase the price of the device, but also increase the power consumption and the scale, which kind of then eliminates the whole point of 24 seven private NAS server ownership compared with big old servers. An example otherwise, yeah, 
would be this device that I've currently reviewed um, and at the moment I'm running some tests on the TVS H874. Now this has got a banging processor there. It's got an Intel 12th core i5. You can get an i7 and an i9. It's 16 cores. It's crazy town bananas. But it's also three to four thousand pounds. And also a lot of that money you're spending isn't even for that CPU. It's for the rest of the architecture around that processor because they've scaled it up. So not all NASes are using pants CPUs, but at the same time, the ones that are using good CPUs then have to ramp up everything else to be according within the world of 24-7 efficient NAS construction. Another one of those novice questions that people seem to jump down people's throat on, which is a very reasonable question, do you need to fully populate this? Because you look at the cost of this, you know, the NASs I've got here on the table are about, between them, about five to 600 nicker each. And you're going, great, that's five hundred and five to 600 nicker I've just spent. Now I've got to put four hard drives in it. What the hell? You don't have to fully populate these devices. All, I repeat, all the NASs that I have talked about here on the channel since the very early days, all of them, and I anticipate all in the future, can run on a single drive be it hard drive or ssd you can put one drive inside install the now software initialize the device and in most cases can expand the storage and just add more drives as you need now there are certain provisos there firstly you have to set the right raid configuration and storage pool that allows you to expand a single drive known as single or jbod to a dual drift disk array such as a raid one or a raid zero but if you want to scale more and add more drives in a RAID 0, you can only stay within a RAID 0, which has all of the drives, but no safety net. If you go from a RAID 1, you can skip to a RAID 5 by adding a new drive there. And then that RAID 5 can continue to go with more drives or scale up to a RAID 6. You can start with one drive and add more drives later as you go, but just be aware of the RAID configuration pathway you're going down. And if you're using a NAS that runs on ZFS, it's a lot harder, and in some cases impossible, to fully scale up or expand a, a ZFS RAID pool. Now, the reason for that is that ZFS RAID pools don't just allow you to just add the drives in most cases, although there is development for uh, a way around this that is happening right now that will hopefully resolve this. If you have uh, drives in a RAID a ZFS RAID configuration with things like TrueNAS and that, when you add more drives, what they do is internally it creates another RAID group but attaches them all in the same storage pool, which isn't the same as adding drives to an existing RAID pool, uh, RAID storage pool. Now, what about mixing drives? What if I want to use, you know, I've got 10 TB drives in there, I want to grab some 14 TBs, I've got WD, but I want to slam in some Seagates as well. Is that possible? 100% yes. All NADs will allow you, the keyword, allow you to install different drive capacities and different drive models. However, the results is what will differ from brand to brand. So, for example, there just had a beat from a NAS in the corner. Um, for example, in the case of uh, a QNAP, you can put a 10TB, a 12TB, a 14TB, and a 20TB if you choose. But they do not have flexible RAID configurations and it will classify every drive in that RAID group, OW, um, as the smallest available drive in terms of uh, redundancy. So if you've got a 10 in there and the 12 and the 14 and the 20 TB, they're all going to be seen as 10 TB drives within the system. Also, different drive models can have different RPMs, different cache levels, and that can be a less stable RAID configuration. So yes, you can do it, but that's one of the many reasons it's not advised. One, because traditional RAIDs will cap all the drives at the slow or smallest capacity. And also, there's an element of instability having drives that are built slightly different and wound up a different way. Now, in the case of things like Terramaster and Synology, um, and Drobo, for that matter, just behind me, they have flexible RAID systems where you can attach multiple drives in different capacities. And instead of classifying every drive as the smallest drive, it will work out internally the largest amount of space that's needed as a safety net. So the largest drive in the configuration, it creates that much safety net known as parity or redundancy, uh, not parity, uh, parity is the blueprint. Redundancy, the safety net, and then from there, it will give you all of the new capacity. So you can mix, 
but make sure you understand the scenario you're within and you can start with one drive and scale up but just be aware of the raid ladder you're going up This is another quite recurring question, and this generally comes from users that have purchased a NAS a number of years ago, let's say four to five to six years, and rather than buying a whole brand new NAS, they've looked at the depreciating cost of CPUs or secondhand CPUs or even modern generation CPUs and gone, rather than buy a whole new NAS, can't I just whip out that CPU, get a CPU of the same socket and just bang that CPU in there? No, unsurprisingly, in most cases, you can't do that. Now, there are a few reasons for that. Now, the first, one of the first main reasons, and definitely from the branded side, we're going to put that ever so slight proprietary hat on here. When you have the firmware and software that goes on these systems, they have one software, for example, uh, DSM or QTS, but that version has been tweaked and tailored towards all of the different NAS models. So QNAP, for example, have about 12 different kinds of 4-bay, I think, at the moment, give or take, currently available in circulation, not just, oh, we're going to discount all the old gen for now. And on those, that means that QTS for this system, they're going to be at least 12 different versions based on the Celeron dual core, the Celeron quad core, the Realtek, the A55. And if you try to get, uh, if you try to upgrade the CPU inside these, such as using a Celeron where the Celeron family has used a very similar socket um, connection on all of their gens, if you try to use one of the new ones, that software will recognize that it's not using that CPU. And for the case of stability of the data in the system, as well as warranty and support and running of the system within safe parameters, what they state, it won't allow you to upgrade the CPU. Now, that's not a black and white rule. Users have managed, in some cases, to change up the CPU internally to um, use a newer gen CPU within that configuration. But the boundaries are pretty slim. You can't go, for example, from a sixth generation Intel uh, i3 up to a 12th gen. You can work within certain pre-revisions, and you know it can work, but you will knack your warranty, but you may already be out of your warranty anyway. And it will also certainly nullify any kind of support they can give you on the software warranty. Now, when it comes to Synology, when it comes to a bunch of other brands other than QNAP there, I've not seen any real world and keep word here, stable examples of CPUs being upgraded. People have tried it and there have been successes online. But once again, it requires a lot of modification of the uh, .pat file, which is the Synology download file of the firmware, in terms of modification now there are examples of people using Synology software on custom built servers and again the legal line on that between open source software and proprietary development on top of that is a debate we can have until the end of time but overall on points you can't upgrade the CPU realistically within its lifespan without a lot of work and a lot of knowledge and a lot of hurdles along the way Now, this last one is a point that's been arising for the last two years because of the way NASs have moved more and more towards support of KVM, keyboard video mouse. And a lot of users want to know, can they just use this as a standalone computer? They like that they can use it as a NAS and that's great, but they want to know that either later on in its life when they've upgraded the NAS or gone to another server, or just generally while the system doing nothing 24 seven, oh, not 24 seven, like 23 hours out of 24, it's not doing a great deal. They want to know, can they use it as a computer? And the simple answer is yes, in some cases. In the case of Synology and TerraMaster, no, you can't, you can, Put a virtual machine using Synology Virtual Machine Manager or um, uh, a virtual box on TerraMaster and that allows you to install a virtual machine that you can access remotely on your web browser as a standalone computer but you can't bung in a keyboard, um, um, a video output like an HDMI monitor and a mouse and use it as a computer. However, in the case of Acer Store and uh, QNAP, you do have options in KVM. A lot of QNAP NASs have HDMI outputs and support KVM as well as in the case of QNAP a banging virtual machine tool in the case of virtual uh, virtualization station and that allows you and Linux station as well it allows you to install Windows um, you know we're talking Windows 11 Windows 10 etc as well as Ubuntu of uh, several versions of Ubuntu on there and other third-party VMs onto the system attach a keyboard and a mouse and a monitor and you can use it as a standalone computer if you choose and at the same time, the NAS is still B 
being used as a NAS. It's running parallel. It's not running instead of the NAS software, it's running parallel, thanks to HD Station and support of QVM on the platform. Now again, is possible with an Acer Store, but with the Acer Store, you will be using um, Acer Store Portal there and using third-party application VirtualBox, just like you saw on the TerraMaster. But again, you can run a KVM setup, allowing you to use the NAS as a NAS, and at the same time, a media server, and at the same time as your virtual machine there, along with surveillance and all the other tools in between. But this has been 10 questions, or uh, you know, as the title says, 10 dumb questions about NAS that aren't actually that dumb. Now, I am sure this video could inspire a bunch more questions that people are either too intimidated to ask about NAS, or that they've asked in the past, got the resolution and realized you know what that's a perfectly valid point there so let me know in the comments i would love to make a video about this that completely demystifies this subject beyond any reasonable doubt so if you've got a question about nads and i'm going to be scouring through the comments more than usual to find your questions and once i reach another 10 that i think are reasonable i'll make another video like this but otherwise thank you so much for watching i hope this has helped you in buying your first nas and be a little bit uh, less intimidated about which is arguably quite an expensive purchase for the home or business thank you so much for watching click like if you enjoyed it subscribe to learn more as we do more videos like this and others of course a video every day and Use a free advice section if you need more help over on NAS Compares. Head to the website, it's linked below, right inside of the screen. There's a little blue button there that says, if you need advice, use it. Otherwise, there's the community forum, Ask NAS Compares, where me, Eddie, who does more work on it than me, I'll be straight with you, and other members of the NAS community are answering your questions. And lastly, if you found this video helpful and want to can you know help me continue doing this, use the links in the description to Amazon if one, the video has helped you, two, you were gonna buy from Amazon anyway, and three, you want to keep me going. So simple as that. Use those links. It will take you to Amazon. And whatever you buy there, it doesn't have to be what it's linked to. It can be literally anything. As long as you use that link to get there, it won't cost you any extra. And we get a kickback from whatever you buy, which helps me and Eddie, just us running this, do everything we do. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. And I'll see you next time.